Welcome back to the course in Nuclear Medicine Physics. Today we're focusing on quantitative imaging. In previous lectures, we talked about things like attenuation correction, scatter correction, and things like PET, correcting for random coincidences, and things like SPECT, making sure we take into account the resolution of the collimators that we use. So this lecture can be thought of as a review of all those important subjects that we touched on in the past. Remember that our ultimate goal is to determine the activity or megabecquerels of radiation in different regions of the body. And so we need to make sure that we're doing everything possible, every correction that we need to, in order to properly determine what that looks like in a 3D scan. Hey everyone. So first we're gonna do a very quick review again of quantitative imaging. And the reason I'm doing this is it kind of summarizes what Armand has been talking about, but it's something that is really, really important to understand before we go into dosimetry, because in dosimetry, we really, really need quantitative imaging. So part of this is gonna be a, a, a review of what we've already done, but we're gonna go one little extra step with an example. So if you remember when we talked about filter back projection or back projection, Let's say when we were acquiring a uniform image of, of an image of a uniform sphere of a uniform cylinder, it looks like the one on the left. If you just do filter back projection, back projection, you reconstruct an image that looks like the one on the right. And Armand talked about this, but something's wrong in this image. And if you see, this was supposed to be uniform, but when we look at that image, when we look at this image, is darker in the middle and it's brighter on the edges. So something's wrong because we knew it was supposed to be uniform. So the reason that happened, and I think I'm, I'm again talk about this, is if we leave this uncorrected and we go and measure something in that image, we draw, let's say, a region of interest here in the middle, we're gonna be obtaining less counts than what should actually be there. So, so there's a problem with that image. It's not giving me the true information. So what is quantification? And say for the purpose of most of the things that we do in nuclear medicine, we really want to determine the accurate distribution of activity in tissue. So we can ask some questions. We can ask, what is the amount of radioactivity that's circulating in the blood? What is the amount of radioactivity that has been a that has been taken by the kidneys or how much is the uptake of radioactivity that has been uptaken by tumors? What is the concentration of the activity in another region of interest? And later on, if we're able to measure this, we can ask the question, what is the radiation that was delivered to a patient and to its individual organs after a radionuclide therapy treatment? Okay, so what affects quantification? And we quickly saw in SPEC, we have issues like attenuation, scatter, there's the collimator blurring, partial volume effects, the system normalization. And we've talked about those in previous lectures. In PET, we have again, attenuation, scatter, but we have non-uniform resolution, the randoms, the multiples, again, partial volume effects and system normalization. And really quick, attenuation inspect, again, remember, we have two sources. Ideally, a photon will travel, it gets detected. But if, it, if we have another source in which a photon is attenuated, it never reaches the detector, we will never know that that source is there. And the way this is corrected is we do a CT scan, we measure the attenuation values and from our attenuation formula, then we go back trying to add the photons that were attenuated. In PET, and I'm going to talk in detail about this, we now have two photons. So if we lose one or we lose the other or we lose both, then we're losing the coincidence and we can correct for attenuation. Well, basically we need to detect one and the other photon. So that's why this is multiplied. And attenuation in PET is basically depending only on the total width. And then we talked a little bit about scatter. How, in principle, for example, this isotope, which is cesium-137, should have only 
one emission here around 662 keV, but because of scattering the medium, the spectrum that you collect has many, many more energies. And we talked about the Compton edge, the backscatter peak, and how this was formed. Again, remember, we're only interested in the 662 kVs, at least for this example. And I wanted to touch a little bit more into this slide, how to correct for scatter inspect. And you guys did something about this in lab number one. But again, scatter is, if you have a primary photon, ideally it will travel directly to the detector, but you can have a situation in which a photon moves in this direction, scatters here, and then gets detected. This will give you an impression that there is a source in this line, which is not true. So again, that's degrading your image. So if we look, for example, at the spectrum of lutetium-177, uh, the primary, lutetium-177 has energies at 208 kV and 113 kV. Well, there's also a lower energy, but these are the two main photo peaks. What I'm showing is in red here is the ideal spectrum. But when you actually go and measure it, there's this blue component, which is scattered. So at the end, you end up measuring the black, the black dashed line. And what we see is if we're putting an energy window down here around the 208 kV, there's some scatter adding count into my 208 kV photo peak window. Um, so what we typically do is we set two energy windows besides the photo peak. So let's say the lower scatter window and the upper scatter window, those are how we typically refer to. And we talked about this in lab number one, you guys did the calculation, but basically we use a trapezoid to calculate the area under this curve that is scattered to remove those scatter counts from the photo peak window. And, and you can think that the total count in the photo peak window is equal to the primary count plus the scatter. So, so come, let me come back. So these primaries, which are, which are the, sorry, these primaries, which are the reds, plus this scatter, which is the blue, gives me the black. So if we take, if we only want to measure the primaries, then let's just subtract the scatter from all the counts that we calculate. And an estimate of that scatter, again, it comes from a trapezoid in this area, in which the area of a trapezoid is basically calculated as base one plus base two times the height of that trapezoid divided two. And that's basically what we're doing here. You guys did it in lab number one. So you calculate scatter, you can subtract the scatter from the photo peak window, and that gives you ideally the primaries, only the photons coming from, from the source. There are more methods to correct for scatter. There's convolution, Monte Carlo methods, analytical methods. Each of them has its own advantages, but I mean, for example, Monte Carlo and analytical methods take more time. They might be a little bit more accurate, but in practice, we see that those window methods are very good approximation, are faster and easier to implement. Then in PET, again, we talked about scattering PET. I'm going to summarize that very well. Um, if you have one photon scatters, it's just going to shift the line of response that we're detecting. So it's going to give us an impression that that annihilation event happened somewhere where it's not the true case. And one example of how to correct for, for scattering PET is this tail method, in which I think I mentioned it a little bit in, in that lecture. But if you have your patient, ideally, well, there's only radioactivity inside your patient. So let's say we know that the limit of our patient in this sinogram is around here. This goes from here to here. But, but, but you can see that there's counts being detected outside the patient. So of course, there shouldn't be any radiation outside the patient. So what we typically do is we take those counts from outside the patient and we fit a curve, we fit a Gaussian using those tails. It will look something like this. This is our sinogram of the tails. And then if we remove those that Gaussian, from, that Gaussian fit from the total sinogram, ideally we obtain a sinogram in which we have removed scatter. And again, that's just one of the methods that, that has been used for scatter correction. I'm not gonna go in detail of this, I'm gonna talk about it, but there's randoms in PET, there's all these things that affect the resolution of PET, like the positron range, in which the positron travels a little bit before annihilating. There's the non-collinearity in which 
the positron has some momentum before, well, when the annihilation happens, so the photons are now not anti-parallel. There's the intrinsic resolution of the block detector, which it can shift a little bit the position of the, of the line of response. And then this is what causes the effect of the depth of interaction. But at the end, a PET system resolution, we can say that it's dependent on the detector resolution, the positron range, the positron non-collinearity. And when you add all those effects, it typically comes at two of those, slightly bigger than four millimeters. So you can say the resolution of a PET system is at least four millimeters. When you look at the resolution in the field of view is very good in the center, but as you start moving, in that axis towards the right, because of the depth of interaction, your Gaussian starts getting wider and wider. So again, this I'm just giving this summary just to understand our images can have can suffer all these degrading effects. And when we have all these degrading effects, it means that the counts, or when I go and draw an region of interest in that image and I measure counts, they might not be representing the truth. So in quantitative imaging, again, what we do is we want to correct for all those degrading effects. And if we correct for all those degrading effects, then my image contains all the information about those primary photons. That means all the information that originated in the patient in, from that radioactive source and that I can know how many photons, well, because we're doing imaging, how many particles did did we actually, sorry, how many particles actually are coming from that source inside the patient? Um, so when I do that, then I go and draw an ROI and my images now have the correct number of photons in each pixel. However, remember these systems measure counts. So we still need a calibration factor, something that converts counts to our quantity of interest. And that quantity of interest for us in nuclear medicine is either radioactivity, like something in units of, let's say, mega becquerel, or activity concentration, typically, let's say, mega becquerel per milliliter. Um, so, how do we obtain that calibration factor? And you guys did it in lab number one, but what we typically do is we take a source, we know exactly how much radioactivity is in that source, we perform a scan, and then we collect some counts, and we know, and we do all the corrections that are needed, and then we say, okay, I know that these are all the counts that I'm detecting for a source that has this amount of radioactivity. So then I can do a conversion factor. So what is that scan that you typically do inspect? So in PET, inspect is, well, you can do either a planar or a tomographic acquisition. Uh, planar is faster and simpler. And although there's little attenuation and scatter, if you do a point source, you still need to perform scatter correction. Um, attenuation is very small, but so scatter correction will matter much more here. What you guys did in lab number one was you did the analysis of one of those point sources being scanned, well, doing a planar scan, you guys knew how much activity was there. And at the end, you ended up calculating the sensitivity. That was the last value that you guys presented in lab number one. For that particular camera, that was the calibration factor for scanning of lutetium-177. Now, some people prefer to do a tomographic scan. They think that they say, they suggest that that approximates the patient geometry much better. Well, but a tomographic scan is more time consuming and well, you need more time filling the phantom, it's kind of more involved. But from some research that we've done, and I was part of that research, we were able to show that planar scans, the, a point source, a planar scan of a point source is basically giving you the same results as doing all these more complex procedure. So that's why we've adopted the planar scans. And I think now that's also becoming more like the standard. What do we do in PET? So in PET, we take a known cylinder of, well, we take a cylinder of water and we add some radioactivity. We, we, we use F18 for this. And well, 
we mix that very well. So in that case, now we know how much is the true activity concentration in that phantom. And we do this scan, we scan this phantom. Again, we collect count. We know exactly how much is the activity concentration in that phantom. And then we can convert the detected count into a true activity concentration. If you guys go and look at lab number two, the part that we gave us a bonus in which we talk about SUV, that's an, the image that I give you guys there is actually one of the scans of that cylindrical phantom for F18 in which you guys will know how much activity was there. You guys know the volume, everything is that in the header. You'll be able to calculate how much is the calibration factor. So, so in those labs, you have been dealing on how is that we calibrate the equipment. Okay, but, okay, give me one sec. So there was a question in the chat. I think a man commented it very well, but let me just quickly show the example. It has to do, okay, the question is why the resolution degrades at the edges, basically it was referring to, it was referring to this figure. So it's basically because of this depth of interaction effect. So if you have a photon in the center, well, sorry, if we have an annihilation that happens in the center and let's say the photons travel up and down, they enter perpendicular to the detector. So it will be a situation in which this photon is coming perpendicular to the detector and it basically just goes straight. So you will see, okay, your photon multiplier tube will detect that your photon came here and, 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 and this is the case. Uh, but when you have, when you start moving to the side, now these photons reach the detector at an angle. So let's say your photon hits the detector here. You're, it's supposed to correspond to a line of response coming in this line, but my like, photon can keep traveling forward a little bit and maybe interact all the way down here. So it will give you the impression that the photon actually interacted, sorry, actually came from here when it actually came here. So this shifts your line of response by a little bit. So it gives us a bigger uncertainty on where exactly the annihilation happens. So that's why as you start moving to the right, your Gaussians start getting bigger. You have a bigger uncertainty. Okay, so this finishes quantitative imaging again, keep in mind, quantitative imaging. This is gonna be very important for those imagery. That's why I'm touching on this topic today. We need to know, to be able to perform accurate dosimetry, and we're gonna look at that on Thursday, but if we don't have quantitative images, there's no way that we can trust our dosimetry measurements. That's why this is so important. So